it's wonderful to see uh, all the chats coming in from friends and colleagues, former students. Uh, it's really wonderful to have all of you with us. So good evening uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Matero. Uh, I'm chair of the graduate program in historic preservation here at the Weizmann School of Design uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I appreciate everyone making the time to join us tonight, especially when we all know screen time has become the dreaded new normal uh, for many of us. Nevertheless, we thought we'd take advantage of what the screen is good at, uh, which is showing film followed by conversation. So I hope everyone had a chance to view Lauren Levine's gorgeous telling of the story of Unity Temple and its recent restoration, which was released a few days ago with the registration. Before I introduce my co-moderator and our panelists, let me um, leave you with a few thoughts. There are great buildings and there are great restorations. Sometimes both come together. Tonight, we have three members of an extraordinary team who had the vision, the expertise, and the determination to oversee the restoration of one of Frank Lloyd Wright's most important commissions uh, by his own as well as posterity's assessment. All buildings like people have their stories. And so it should be no surprise that in the course of this latest attempt to find relevance and truth in this remarkable building, um, a new chapter of insights and experiences have been added to that saga that all buildings great and small possess. Um, and I know as the historians in the audience know full well, most great works of art and architecture have had their histories told often more than once. What is less common is the telling of the story, and I'm happy to say increasing stories of their preservation and restoration. Uh, a favorite uh, definition of preservation is that it is the sum total of the ways in which the present maintains living contact with the past. To do that, it must be both a physical and a social act but we should remember it's also a critical act in that observation, experience, reflection, and reasoning are essential to its practice. That I think um, is what this film eloquently reveals um, and celebrates. So with that in mind, uh, Michelangelo Sabatino and I will lead a conversation with the team that we've assembled to discuss the film uh, and the restoration project. And uh, remind the audience uh, to continue that conversation uh, to place any questions in the webinar Q&A and uh, we will field those um, after we kick this off. Okay, um, let me make some introductions. Michelangelo Sabatino is director of the PhD program in architecture and is the John Vinci Distinguished Research Fellow at Illinois Institute of Technology. He's the author of numerous books uh, that have broadened our understanding of modernism. The most recent, a beautiful tome, uh, Modern in the Middle, Chicago Houses, 1929 to 1975. Lauren Levine is a film producer and director and has worked in all phases of production and post-production in feature films and in television. Currently, um, she's in post-production of Rising Up, a longitudinal documentary about student activists immersed in the student activated movement to prevent gun violence and reform gun legislation. Gunny Harbo is an architect in private practice with over 30 years experience in historic preservation and sustainable design. He is a fellow of the AIA and US ECOMOS and has built an international reputation through his work on some of the most iconic modern buildings by Mies, by Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan to name a few. And finally, Dorothy Kratzer is an architectural conservator and the director of Building Conservation Associates, Philadelphia. Her work experience is extensive, including projects at the US Capitol, 
the UN and the Jefferson Memorial. So with that, uh, I'm going to kick off the first uh, question, uh, which is for Lauren. Why a film on historic preservation and why Unity Temple? Oh, well, hi everyone. How I came to it was through a friend of mine who had just gotten a cool new gig as the executive director of the Unity Temple Restoration Foundation. So they were preparing to begin the process. And I just said, wow, that's amazing. And you should document that somehow. And several months later, she put a bid out and they, the board decided they wanted to do a documentary. So we, we dug in. Low budget. Um, so you had to really manage it efficiently, which, which was a little tricky with yeah, as everyone knows, things that involve any kind of construction. So that, that became tricky. And actually, Frank, the way you introduced it, the way you framed it, that's exactly what I learned in the process of making the film. I realized, of course, the building needed to be a character. And I realized I want to include the community and the social aspects of it, and even some of the religious background. But the first task at hand was to figure out the logistics. And of course, Gunny was key to that and really helped me wrap my head around the whole project. And then we just kept in touch as we went. And there's no way I could have gotten the footage I got without a high level of cooperation from the entire team. I became best friends with the project manager, the guy with the hard hand and the walkie talkie. And it was, oh, Scotty, what are we doing today? You know, that kind of a thing. So I so guess, yeah. I mean, how far in advance uh, did you plan this? Because obviously there's no going back uh, to get footage when things have happened. So did, did this, did your project commence with the restoration? How much in advance? Uh, you know, it's a, uh, I, I don't even know how long this project took. Uh, but clearly the video suggests you were there for most of it, if not all of it. It took 20 uh, years, Frank, just for the record. <laughs> that's but right. It took more than that, 30 years. You were know. a child when it started. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for me, as soon as I knew I might be doing it, I sent a camera person there to film the interior and exterior before they put any scaffolding or fencing or anything up so that I had shots of before and after kind of a thing. Right. So it, it took, I was there off and on for the almost two years of the restoration process mm -hmm. and just in super, super, super close touch. And I had, if I wasn't most of the time I was there myself and some of the time I even shot, actually there's shots in there that I shot with my iPhone. And because something was happening and I was just, I got to get it, you know, so the iPhone that shoots 4K, it's okay for a handful of shots. Um, and then it was almost another year of, of editing, partly because of funding and time and just things like that. But it was fairly intense process editing wise, because as you said, there was a lot of footage. I had about 50 hours of footage. Yeah. Well, uh, just, thank just you. Add to, can I just add to that, that that there was almost a year of uh, pre-construction research, mock-ups, all that stuff, which was quite well documented in the form of photographs, and those were inserted in to, to fill, tell that part of the story, like when they did we did the in situ uh, windows and you know removing layers of paint, trying to see if we could get the paint off and stuff like that. That was done with Dorothy and and several other of the same uh, crew that, that actually executed the work. They, we did, we did a, numerous trials and stuff like that. And, and that wasn't filmed because that was happening. That had happened before the film crew got engaged, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it'll come up in the questions, but, and I'm sure people in the audience are wondering, how do I get one of those, uh, you, you know? Um, but so I think it's really important to uh, untangle uh, and, and, and talk about the uh, incredible planning that's necessary to do this. We often come at this too late and the stories uh, of the process are not told, just the product. And um, so I'm, I'm sure we'll hear more, more, more about this. Um, all right, let me turn it over to Michelangelo. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thanks to all of you. I feel very privileged to be part of this conversation this evening. 
Uh, Unity Temple is a stone's throw from where I live in Riverside. So it's a constant presence. Uh, uh, so my question, uh, you know, to Lauren, but to uh, Gani or Dorothy is like, what were the creative and logistic challenges and what discoveries did you make uh, during the process that changed your approach uh, to your work in filming and or the actual preservation project? You know, were there, what were the aha moments um, that, you know, that you forced you to step back and rethink what you were doing? Uh, Lauren, if we start from you and then maybe Gunny and Dorothy can jump in at, at leisure. Well, one thing just real quick is, is that I was thinking recently that I had interviewed Gunny early on to, be my anchor interview. So you want to have at least one, maybe two interviews that are really, you know, all the way through telling you the story. And I realized so much had happened that I wanted to interview him again. And so I just didn't let the traditional concept of, oh, they have to be wearing this. He did wear the same blue shirt, but um, <laughs> we didn't, uh, I did say, yeah, go ahead, wear the same blue shirt. But we shot it a little bit differently. And I was like, okay, who cares? They don't match. And then I got him standing up telling me some things, which, you know, I'll hand it off to Gunny. And, you know, he would walk me through the challenge that, is, that he was facing. Right. And what about you, Gunny? Like, what was, you know, as you did your mock ups, your analysis, were there like really critical moments that you learned that kind of, that what you learned changed a way of addressing the restoration project? Uh... Well, one of the, I mean, one of the advantages that we spent almost a year doing the research and the trials and all that stuff up front was that we eliminated a lot of the surprises uh, because you don't want surprises. They usually end up taking time and costing money. So that's the, the uh, two things you want to try to avoid. Um, and we were really, really lucky that we had a client. Uh, first of all, we, we have to never forget to thank our client, the Elfwood Foundation was extremely generous. This thing never, ever, ever, ever would have happened without the Elfwood Foundation, uh, you know, doing it basically. And, um, uh, and of course, all the people involved, but, but without that money, without the, the, the direction to do it right, to do everything we could to, first of all, understand what needed to be done, and then to make sure we executed it absolutely correctly was, uh, and you know, it's a very rare animal. I can say that for in 30 years I've been doing this, you don't really often get that kind of opportunity and it was fantastic and we took advantage of it. We made sure we knew, you know, I asked a lot of questions. We got really far ahead in the, in the, um, in the preliminary thing. But then when we got to the actual project, of course, we were refining it and fine tuning it. And that's why, you know, we, we get, Dorothy involved and you know that you, you see all those scenes of where they're doing the actual work and the mock-ups and then we we check out things that that it, there was no real surprise in that other than the fact that that it was working <laughs> beautifully um the only two real surprises were the structural failure of, of the roofs over the classrooms that we discovered in the course of the thing that was a big hiccup and uh I, I think other than that uh, and then we lost John the plasterer in the middle of it. He had a hernia operation, <laughs> but those actually those two things co coincided, and so we didn't really lose any time because of that, which was actually uh, lucky. There was, well, I don't want to jump ahead to the to the crafts people, but that that was a key element of the whole thing, which we'll get to in, later in the discussion, I think. Thank you, Gunny. And what about you, Dorothy? Yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, I just follow up on what Gunny said, which is I think. Um, you know, it was many years in the planning, um, and I'll, I will credit, Gunny credited his client, but I will credit my client, who was Gunny, just <laughs> to say that, um, you know, I think a large part of why the project was a success was because uh, Gunny, from the beginning, wanted to do the restoration the right way, which meant for a very long, protracted planning phase, which is often hard for people to get behind. But what it allowed us to do in terms of the paint finishes, so I, my um, involvement was uh, documenting and then helping to figure out how to replicate the original paint and plaster finishes, So, which is a lot of what the film t touches on. And I think because we were able to have such a good understanding of what those finishes were based on archival research, but also lab 
analysis, that going into construction, all that was left, we knew what it looked like under the microscope, but what was left, which was a big piece of it, was how do you translate that to the actual walls. Um, so in terms of um, kind of lessons learned or, or um, I wouldn't say it's an aha moment, but something that really um, emphasized that I think I was emphasized in my mind was the importance of a conservator and a decorative painter working together to get to combine what is what we're seeing in the lab, what we're seeing, when we're looking at paint samples, and then how that gets applied to the building. So that was a very um, uh, rewarding part of it for me. Thank you. And and a, and a key to the success of the thing. Yeah. You know, it was collaborative from the first to get go. Yeah, yeah, and we. I'll just I'll just add that you know, as a conservator, we're a conservator who does paint studies is not always involved during construction in the way that I was. And I think that is one reason it was successful was that we had that collaboration between the painter and the conservator through planning and into construction. So the same people and there was consistency, so. Great, thank you, Dorothy. And uh, to you, Frank. Okay, so let me just um, clarify to the audience. We have a, just a few questions that uh, we've put up front to tease out some uh, big concepts, uh, thoughts, process, uh, and then very quickly, we're going to turn it over uh, to the 150 plus participants. I, I see the questions are coming in, uh, in both the chat and in the Q&A. So it's gonna be a bit of a uh, back and forth going, going to both platforms to see what you're asking, but have patience and we will get to most of these. So the next question we had um, um, was for Gunny. Uh, this is a big question, I think. I mean, it could take the whole evening. I, I, I hope it doesn't, but um, it really has to do with context. Um, uh, what lessons learned, uh, so sorry, during the restoration project, the serial nomination of Frank Lloyd Wright sites was submitted to the World Heritage Committee for consideration, as I'm sure many of you, you know. Um, so what effect, if any, did that have on the project? Um, in terms of, you know, making the all-star list. Um, how, how did that affect the project? And what's been the aftermath, too? Well, uh, first of all, you know, we, we, we saw it as a great opportunity and honor the fact that they were going to do this. And at the time, I have to say, I was a board member of the Franklin Wright Building Conservancy, so I was very aware of the effort that went into the... Uh, the establishment, the writing of that of that um, document was Herculean, uh, and it was it was it went through two iterations. So the first time they had ten sites, and then it got narrowed down down to the um, to the eight sites that currently are on the list. But it just meant that we knew we already had a lot of scrutiny, uh, regulatory scrutiny. I mean, we had the the city of Oak Park, of course, as a local regulatory agency that would oversee what we were doing. Uh, we had to comply with what they would want. And um, the Landmarks Illinois, which is an easement holder on the building. So they also had a say in what we were doing. And um, I mean, this is a national historic landmark and a state of Illinois landmark and a local landmark. So it's now a World Heritage site. So it has everything, everybody that has a say in such things had something to say. Uh, but of course, we were always intending to do the right thing, no pun intended, that we would be taking this thing to the max and doing it all uh, as thoroughly and as, as faithfully as we could. Uh, so we weren't really, didn't have any trepidation about it, but it did, it certainly did, uh, it wasn't lost on us that, that we were actually now dealing with something that was at an echelon that not many sites in the United States are at. And, uh, you know, these, these right sites, including Roby House, which we actually worked on uh, sort of simultaneously to this is another one. And it just means that um, you got to got your, you got to have your game, you got to have it together because people are looking at this and they come and they inspect it, you know, the, the, the uh, visiting team of architects came to see what was going on and to make sure that they're reporting back to the World Heritage Committee uh, that we were worthy of being part of the serial nomination. So let me, Gunny, can I ask you another question? I'll, I'll try to phrase this as delicately as I can. <laughs> uh, do you think 
I mean, did the restoration, the restoration was planned and in progress and known to the committee. So I guess the question is, did the, uh, did the pending restoration, you think, have any leverage or influence on the building being placed on the, uh, on, on the list, or did it get there on its own merits? I mean, it's certainly an important work, but there are a lot of important works that were vying for being on the, on the- Well, I, th I think the fact that it was no longer in danger, you know, this building had been on the endangered list. Right. So both by uh, the local, I mean, I, I wasn't kidding. I worked on this project for close to 20 years. And back in the beginning, this thing, you know, they, they did a pro, I got involved when they had to replace the concrete on the overhangs because the overhangs were failing and concrete was falling down and they got a grant for 3 million bucks to fix that. And that's where I got engaged was to work architecturally on that CTL who was our structural engineer did a fabulous job. They were involved back at that project and uh, we carried through with them. So, you know, if it had still been in the dilapidated condition that it was when you see some of those images, then that would, that would have been not good. Uh, I don't know if it would have kept it from being elevated, but I think it would have been questioned and there would have been a lot of uh, less enthusiasm for things. But the fact that it, you know, was undergoing this major restoration was a good sign to everybody involved. Right. Good. Great. Frank, can I jump in now? Yep. Yes. Great. And so this is uh, the back to you, Gunny and Dorothy. So what uh, lessons learned from a building of universal value like Unity Temple can we perhaps apply to uh, other less notable buildings and whether they're architect designed or my uh, much loved vernacular buildings? Uh, what do you think? And, and if, I mean, if you're also, in terms of your work with the, the craftspeople, you know, in terms of getting them to uh, sort of tweak their skill set to sort of address uh, a, biz, a building of this uh, specificity. Dorothy, you want to take, I, I, I've talked too much, so why don't you take that? <laughs> or I'm, I can jump in, but go ahead. Well, I'll start. I mean, I, I touched upon that just a few minutes ago, that idea of um, of uh, that, that collaboration with the craftspeople, in this case, the decorative painting uh, company Evergreen. Um, and we, we were lucky. I mean, I think they realized from the beginning that it was going to be challenging to replicate the finishes because I think if, if, for those of you who have seen the film or not seen the film, um, the original finishes were a combination of textured plaster and then these glazes that were applied and wiped, um, partially wiped off. So very complicated. Um, and they had all been overpainted. So we really didn't know what they looked like except through the microscope, which was part of the challenge was trying to, again, interpret what you see under the microscope to the wall. So for this project, we're lucky to have very skilled decorative painters, very experienced. So they had the skill set. But what I think is unusual and that they also had that you don't always have is they had an open mind to sit to to listen and learn about what the finishes were that Wright had envisioned for the building and how can we replicate those instead of imparting their own vision for the building and what they thought was right. Um, they had very open minds and, and that's one reason it was a really successful collaboration. So they had to learn, kind of open their mind, learn about what those finishes looked like and then think about how to replicate them. Right. Um, so it's probably very different than any project they'd done before. Thank you. Now, Lauren, uh, what about you? Uh, and this is, I mean, in your filming and I mean, this was a architect design building, but uh, in your experience as a, a documentarist and I mean, have you had opportunities to sort of um, photograph or um, sort of film the vernacular landscape or, or is this sort of something that you, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is your first big uh, sort of architectural sort of uh, documentary. It's definitely the first really in-depth film or documentary about architecture. I had done a handful of Modern Marvels episodes, which a lot of people, they were very popular. Um, so those were complicated subjects that you have to wrap your head around in a much faster period of time. Um, but so this, it, it definitely had challenges that I had to deal with as they came. 
So it was a very fluid process, which I actually enjoyed. First, I was a little wigged out about it because I'm like, how am I going to do this? What am I going to, you know, how am I going to shoot all of it? How am I going to get the footage? I'm going to need a lot of what we call B-roll, the cutaways, right? And then there was the idea of, can I tell a linear story? And can I tell an appealing story about spraying concrete and paint and things like that? Because when you really look at it, when you're looking at a broader audience, Right. You have to make the story interesting. One of the comments, uh, somebody named George said something about that he didn't think there was enough information in there about the, the, the critical parts of the, the buildings that Wright built. And so I decided not to focus on that because it was very, very intricate to tell a linear story with the, that was so much information that you needed to say both verbally and visually. And so to link it together without what I call the man behind the curtain voiceover, which I didn't like and I didn't want to do it. And that's why we had the Brad Pitt kind of transitions. So, you know, choose Brad Pitt. So, um, right. no, it, it that ended up working well. Um, right. And it, it was just a very intricate process to decide how to tell the story, how much to tell the story. There were sections I had that maybe talked about the amount of money that was spent or the leaking and this and that. But when it all came together, I thought I picked what told the story well and, and in a most um, like a path of discovery, I wanted the story to be told in a way uh, like a path of discovery in the, in the same way that he built the building. Right. Now, Lauren, I have a quick question uh, that just came to mind. So there's a lot of drone footage. So did you sort of script that, uh, you know, and uh, was this your first time working with drones or because uh, I know that this has become a, a great uh, hobby, but also professional. And there's these beautiful moments that uh, were in there as well. It's, it's interesting because when we were in it and we were filming and even towards the end, you know, Gunny, when we were, you know, close to the celebration day and all that, people were saying, oh, you should shoot drone footage. And I said, there is no way that Lauren is going to be responsible for a drone going into a window in Unity Temple. I didn't <laughs> want to, I didn't want to do it. I was just too nervous. I just was like, no way am I taking that chance. Once we got editing, um, I guess the editor and I kept talking about it. And one of the, actually the very first guy who shot the very first, you know, bit of video for me, he had learned and he convinced me he was competent <laughs> with the drone. And so I sent him out there well into the editing phase, well after the phase, not that that was the reason, but again, it was him convincing me that he wouldn't crash it. And you're satis you were satisfied with uh, the, what it brought to the, the film? I love, yes, I loved what it brought to the film. If I had it to do again, I would get a springtime shot with flowers and I would get a snow shot. Well, there's plenty of snow uh, in Chicago <laughs> right now. So come yeah. back and do a version for two. Yeah. <laughs> Well, right. I'm, going to, I'm going to interject. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, and Michelangelo, I'm going to ask you if you could man the Q&A because they're coming in in both platforms. Um, but I'm going to interject because it's related to what you've been talking about. We, you know, we'll, we'll try to keep this. And, and everyone, again, we're going to work through the chat and the Q&A questions as they came in. Um, so uh, someone asked, how did you select the on-site film crew since you couldn't be there all the time? H how did that work? I, I, when I started out, I worked, I kind of tested out a couple different camera people and found one or two in particular that I trusted to go on site. And then, and the, and the construction crew and those guys knew him well, cause I wanted everybody to be comfortable. I wanted to be very respectful of the process and safety, you know, precautions and all that kind of stuff. So I had two, one mostly were, he was like Mr. Gear. He had everything. He had the GoPro. He had these, you know, and, but at the end, I made a big decision that was very stressful because it was a lot of money and we were really tight on the budget, but I did decide, and I'm glad I did to bring in a, a like sort of a super pro, a DP who's very experienced, somebody I knew, a documentary filmmaker, 
and all those beauty shots where the sunlight's coming in and things like that and every, everything, the close up of the textures, all that was shot over a, for four days, all we did was film the building. Great. Yeah. Good. Good. So Frank, uh, just, I'm sorry to, so I believe our uh, great Micah has put all the Q and A and chat in together. Uh, so uh, we have only one place to look at and. Uh, good. 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 Okay, uh, then let me finish up with my last question. Um, and then Michelangelo, you have one and then we will uh, dive into the, uh, into the chat Q and A. Um, this one is for uh, Gunny and Dorothy uh, primarily. Um, realizing the research and analysis is always a challenge. How were you able to translate um, what you wanted through the construction process where there are few, if any, norms. Um, you know, in other words, you know, how did you, you had an idea in your mind based on all the research, the upfront research and analysis that you had done. Um, how did you ensure on a project like this, and anyone who's seen the film um, and the, in the chat, I, I, I've seen everyone agrees the level of quality um, was astonishing in this case. How did you make that happen? Or well, we, we had, as uh, we said before, first of all, we had a budget that would afford it. Second of all, we had a team, a totally committed team, both on the construction side, but also our team, our, our A&E team. Bob Score from my office was the project architect. He was there, I don't know, three times a week on average, maybe, sometimes more. I was there at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, you know, for meetings and just to see what's going on and add my two cents. Uh, but we had a really dedicated crew and, and I think you got that, that, that was one of the really lovely things about the film for me was to see, uh, the way Lauren got the, you know, insights from the crew. They took a ton of pride in what they were doing. They, they understood it. Uh, they knew that this was, you know, for a lot of them, I, I don't know that they've ever worked on something better than this or will. And that's true of all of us, maybe, um, uh, you know, in, in our careers, this is a once in a career kind of a opportunity, not just because the building's so fabulous, which it is, but also that you got to do it the way it was supposed to be done. And it, it isn't, it isn't often that you get to do that. And uh, everyone was really committed. I mean, we, Berglund Construction, who was the general contractor, we work with them now on a bunch of things and, and we're working on two also really cool projects with them right now. Um, and they, they get it from the very top and they do a modern construction and everything else, but they have a dedicated preservation crew and um, it just takes a, it takes a mindset and a, and a dedication on the part of everybody and we have that and that, that's why the thing worked and I think that comes through very clearly in the film and none of those people were faking it. They were all, they loved doing what they were doing. I'll add one very mundane thing to what, what Gunny just said, which is the other thing that I think was critical, particularly for the paint finishes, was um, having very good detailed technical specifications and then a lot of mock-ups. <laughs> so having all of that built into the, I mean, it's kind of mundane but and practical, but having that built into the construction documents so that the contractor knows what to expect before they even start working, I think that was um, made it a success too. One, one thing that we've learned over the 30 years we've been doing this is that you need to bake in pretty hard in the, in the spec what you're expecting. And that included on this job certification of tradesmen. So yes, they were dedicated, but we made sure that they knew what the hell they were doing. And that's why we did so many mock-ups. There was only one plasterer out of that big crew, only one guy who was certified for all the different finishes because he's the only one who really understood how to do it. And uh, they had other guys that would do the base coats and whatever, but John, the guy, which is why it was a disaster when he got sick, when he had the hernia operation, <laughs> uh, because he was the only one who had the, he had this ability with the technique. He was a true craftsman, tradesman, but really understood mm -hmm. his craft. And he could get that swirl just the way we wanted it and, uh, and how we knew it had been, because there were a few places still intact in the building, you know, hidden and stuff like that, where you could see these things. Right. And that's what it took. It took, you know, demanding that they perform what we asked them to. And they did. 
Right. I mean, this you say certified. You you mean internally no. certified? No, by in, you. it's in the specification. Right. They right. shall be certified by us, by the architects. And and Bob was out there. I, I can't tell you how many hours we had on the CA. A ton. We always do. We we always have a lot of CA time on our projects, but uh, this one more so than most, and uh, it paid off. Right. So we, we we working with Dorothy and and because uh, she assisted in the specs, of course. But I mean, this goes across everything we did. The the same thing with the guy, the concrete guy. We haven't talked about him enough. So that crew the, mm -hmm. was one man who was the only guy who knew how to put that shot creed on in the right way. And he's the son of the man who did it in the 1970s. I mean, it's just Amazing. stuff like that, you know. Um, so we had a lot of a lot of lucky things for us and uh, but also a lot of diligence and doing our homework up front making sure we had the right mock-ups baking it into the specifications and the drawings and then uh you know hammering through and, and enforcing not that anyone was trying to cheat or anything but but you know we had the ability to say no it's got to be like this and let's make sure we do it that way and you know making the effort to do it three or four times before mm -hmm. we had a bunch of places on the on the building where the concrete had to come back off because it just wasn't right and uh that was also baked in so we didn't get you know tons of change orders and stuff like that which was everyone was nervous about which is why we spent all the time up front to say here's the expectation this is what you're gonna do and if it's not like this you're gonna do it again and <laughs> and we did have to do that in some places sometimes three times right. Other places, first time, no problem. It was, it was, that was really, really tough. That was the hardest technical part. I mean, the painting was hard to figure out what to do, but once they got it going, it, that, that actually took care of itself quite well. It was all sort of in the getting it done, but the, but the execution on the concrete match, it, there's a few places that still don't match, but I mean, you know, you, it, it we knew it wasn't going to be perfect, but we took care of, I'd say 90% of it is, you can't even see it. Thank so, you, Danny. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the questions in the chat, which uh, feeds into the next question that I know Michelangelo is going to ask, has to do with the, um, the problems with, uh, what problems did you find in this building and, and about the challenges? So I just want to link that question, um, you know, to Michelangelo's uh, next and last question from, from us as the moderators. Right, and so just a shout out to Gunny first off. Uh, uh, Gunny and I are teaching a modern architecture and heritage class. So uh, he is dutifully sharing all his wisdom with our students who are uh, attending with us this evening. But I'm gonna do a little bit, Frank, uh, I'm gonna be subversive. Um, since clearly there's been a lot of talk about um, planning, careful planning. Uh, you know, mock-ups and just getting all the ducks in a row. I'm going to just say what was, and I'm going to send it, the question to Lauren, because Lauren is our, our uh, guest of honor tonight in terms of she did the documentary, and we are hopeful that many, many that are here listening this evening will run off and watch it if they haven't already watched it. So my question to you, Lauren, is, what is the most beautiful serendipitous moment? Let's not talk about problems for a second. Let's let's uh, think uh, uh, serendipity. What was the thing that you enjoyed the most uh, that you had never imagined that uh, working on uh, the Unity Temple, aside from having Brad Pitt uh, 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 sort of do voiceovers? <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. I'm glad you didn't tell me I was the guest of honor because I would have been too nervous now. So thanks for saying that. Um, um, you know, I, I think for me, I've always liked space, but I wasn't super, very knowledgeable about architecture and historic preservation. And that was really interesting for me. I loved the minutia. I remember when I first talked to Dorothy, you sent me this big, like, I don't know, 120 page research you had done and I thought wow you know like these microscopic <laughs> things and and the translucency in the paint I loved that um there was a kind of a fun Sarah Dipson's moment in, in filming and, and again that that big decision at the end to spend a fair amount of money in getting these what we call beauty shots 
thank God I did that because you have no idea until you get, man, when you get in an editing room, you need so much footage to cut away to. And we didn't have great weather. We had been shooting for four days. I was like, okay, so I think we got it. And that's what it is. So it's like six o'clock or something and everybody's tired. The crew has put away most of the gear. Heather came by and we're sitting there and the sun comes, the sun comes up into one of those high clear story windows. And I was like, guys, I have some bad news. We got to get the camera out like right now. And, <laughs> and literally 10 or 12 of those shots were shot just because the sun happened to come up before we left the building. Yeah. Great, that's so, exactly what I wanted to hear. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, fun. and now, uh, so- Can I add one thing for me? The, sure. best, the best serendipitous, or the best moment in the movie is starring Dorothy when she walks into that space <laughs> and, and she gets, emo I get emotional thinking about how emotional she was. <laughs> It, it, it was it was priceless because I mean it, if you haven't been in this building you must make a trip to Chicago and go in it because it's gonna yeah. blow your mind it's just phenomenal the way the whole thing comes together and that's the genius of right and if you if you ever yeah. uh, miss that opportunity shame on you because it's an incredible incredible building and and again thanks to <laughs> Alpha Wood for making it possible to re reestablish what it was because it, you didn't get it before. It was these right. the colors were right. I mean, it, Bob Furhoff did the the original uh, paint analysis, and it was quite close on the colors and stuff, but it wasn't the same. And and it's it's just even in the beautiful film that you made and the way that you get the angle, it's just not the same. You got to be in the space. So, Absolutely, and that was that was shocking to me. I'm like, oh my god. It's not, I'm looking at the footage and it's not the same. It's not as special. And I thought, oh my God. But it's and, pretty special, but it's, it, it's much better live for sure. It's it it really is. And that's that's the beauty of the, your introduction, Frank, is the way you put it, the way you framed it is that is it. And and Gunny, when you were sitting up in the top tier and you know, the experience, mm -hmm. you do have to be there. And that's another thing that I learned. And not that we're patting each other on the back, but really the interviews are the reason the film works mm -hmm. and the fact that somebody like you Dorothy that you could come in and you could trust me to say okay wait there don't come in yet I'm going to set the camera we're going to follow you in here and you know that you let yourself be yourself and you trusted us and then we sat down and did the formal interview and really almost everyone was so knowledgeable and so uh, passionate and Again, it's the reason the film works. It really is. But the the right. other thing about that sequence is it, it is the uh, the mirror of when Blair Kamen did his thing, which I thought also Blair Kamen and Paul Goldberger were fabulous. Both of them talked about it in such <laughs> beautiful way, different, different, differently, similar but differently. And um, and you know Blair did that initial thing, and you you had the you did the compression and release and the path of discovery. But Dorothy was, you, she, that wasn't mentioned, but you could see what it was going on there. It was just this boom and just overwhel overwhelming. There is nothing like thinking for 10 years, you know, researching something for 10 years that is a very visual kind of tangible thing. You know, you, you have it in your head, you're, you, you have it all in your mind. And then to go and see it in reality that we don't always get that opportunity as conservators things our work doesn't always get realized in the way that it was at unity temple but i think again you get this intimate relationship with your research and we all do i mean depending on what you're researching you get, you get very it gets very personal so i think in this case you know i had in my head for so many years what i knew the building to look like what wright's original vision was and then to walk in and the way you enter that space is so dramatic in itself in, in itself um, but to walk in and see that after all those years was, it, it was frankly moving. So Frank, I see that, uh, you know, just to jump back to Gunny a little bit and there's some nuts and bolts questions, but you know, uh, uh, Gunny did a, a shout out to, uh, Alpha Wood, uh, who made all of this possible and the research possible with the funding, but there's a specific question 
what was the final cost of the restoration? And uh, I believe there's still some work to be done, but I, if you're allowed to share that uh, kind of, uh, that I think um, Claudia Kemolo would be appreciative. I, I think the number that's used most typically is 25 million, thereabouts. I don't remember the, you know, I don't remember the exact pennies, but it was about 25 million. All everything. Okay, and there's another nuts and bolts. Just uh, uh, Rob Grinch apologizes for asking a boring business question, uh, but he says, "Who paid for the builder's risk insurance policy policies for the contractors? Was it difficult to find a provider?" Uh, well, Berglund is a big, big boy. They get, they can have fifty million dollars worth of insurance. I know that because we're doing a project right now with them for the, in the, in the, it's, in the. Uh, I guess I'm not allowed to say it. It's not a formally announced yet. Anyway, it's in the city of Chicago, in a building owned by the city of Chicago. Stay tuned, and Dorothy has been an integral part of that team, same team, and. Uh, that was a big question about getting that. And yeah, they can get that. And sometimes if there's a if there's an increased premium that they have to pay, then that goes into the cost of the construction. So I'm, I don't know the detail on Unity, how that worked, but I'm guessing that um, number one, they could get it. Number two, whatever the cost of it was, was part of the cost of the project. Okay, Frank, to you, uh, uh, do you wanna go through some of these? Yeah, the Q &A yeah let me just, I, I've been scrolling through. Uh, so uh, again, I'm trying to keep these uh, in the same vein. Uh, somebody's asked, um, did you consider using tax credits to supplement? Uh, were there any tax credits used? Well, it's a, it was a, you know, a not-for-profit organization. There's a long story about the merging of UTRF, Unity Temple Restoration Foundation, which was a not-for-profit created sole purpose was to restore Unity Temple. I think it was formed in the, I should know this, but I think in the 70s. And then the congregation, UT, UTC, which is the same group that built the building originally is the same user. And those two entities, uh, you know, was, were working together to try to restore this thing, but never could quite do it. And they, were, they had different ways of looking at the resource. And one of the things that this restoration did was to create a unified uh, entity that now actually owns the building, UTF. Is that what it is? UTP, sorry, UTP. And um, both those entities have membership in their board structure. Um, so anyway, it's a not-for-profit, so there's really no way to take advantage of tax credits. And it would be really hard to figure out a way to do it anyway, because there's very little uh, revenue generation other than from weddings and stuff like that. So it, did, it, it is not a good model for this. Unfortunately, again, we had the financing from Alpha Wood, so we didn't need such a thing. But good question. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, so some of the questions now want to take us to the dark side. Um, <laughs> so they, not, they haven't been in the building to see how beautiful uh, and light filled I'll, it is. I'll try to uh, frame this. So um, Wright is notoriously known for um, creating problems for folks like you who um, need to what deal with keep issues us in business. <laughs> right. Good one. So, so could you talk a bit about the challenges in terms of um, not just uh, the the you know the the common givens of deferred maintenance or obsolete systems, but some real challenges that were simply due to um, uh, technology that couldn't f meet Wright's vision or. Uh, dare I say, even shortcuts or uh, aspects of the building that uh, uh, resulted from a, a cost overrun, which we know historically happened. Um, you know, anything you want to talk about that um, really created difficulties for you. And in fact, to make it even more complicated, might have um, challenged um, evoking the architect's intent when it was just not good. Well, that 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 is a uh, a conundrum sometimes for us in in working on projects where there's a fundamental flaw in the original design and uh, it never was right and you know it's still not right or whatever. In this case, I think the biggest 
biggest challenge in that regard were the roofs. I mean, it, it, it was a lot. I mean, Lauren got that. She told that story actually very well in the movie. Um, you know, there I don't know. We, there are different counts on how many roofs, but there's 17 levels. I'll believe Joseph Siri because Joe Siri knows knows <laughs> knows a lot about the history of that building. And if he says 17, I'll take that number. But um, and all of them leaked at some point. I mean, and that that is deferred maintenance because they did not take care of that building. Uh, hmm. You know, and that that was the number one because it's an expensive building to take care of. So now they have that. They're going to have that ongoing situation so part of the thing is to try to develop an endowment that they can actually do that um and we used superior you know someone's gonna ask me what is the roofing system because i'm not gonna be able to tell them but anyway I, i'd have to defer to bob could tell you in a heartbeat um it's a it's a uh, a contemporary really well done roof that's flashed appropriately we made bigger downspout holes. I mean, the internal drainage was a huge problem because the drain was only this big and everything clogged up, uh, stuff like that. We, we took advantage of our opportunities to improve Mr. Wright's flaws, but uh, mostly we left alone what he did. And it, it's, you know, he's notorious for leaky roofs, but so was Mies, but you know, that, 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 that is something that's often just a technological, uh, innovation away from being fixed and i think we i think we did it but they're still going to have to maintain it you got to go up and make sure there's not stuff leaves in the drains and all that that has to be done regularly nobody ever wants to do that maintenance i don't know mm -hmm. if i fully answered that but anyway that was the roofs were the biggest problem i'd say and then on the on the mechanical side lauren also told that very well maybe you want to talk about that mark nussbaum shout out to mark our uh, MEP engineer, who is a small shop, and we work with him whenever we get a chance. He works pre pretty much everything we do. He figured it out, and it was not easy. Frank, uh, can I direct a couple of questions to uh, Lauren? Okay, uh, we... So, Lauren, this is more a technical question. So, but how did you handle any lighting and audio challenges amidst? Uh, it says all the work noise, scaffolding, and constant movement with tight space at the site. Now you mentioned that you you got there, you know, before work or scaffolding was installed. But if uh, how did you you know did you use wide angle lenses or did you have to use certain types of cameras? So uh, I think we have a, f a film buff uh, or a, a director in the uh, audience. Yeah. Okay. So mostly about the technical just noise factor being able to record and all that right Is that and the lighting lighting and lighting. audio yeah well i basically realized early on that uh, you know i only shot those initial shots just to get a bare bones this is what it looked like before they started and then once we were there I realized this is the story we're here this is we're gonna hear banging we're gonna hear maybe somebody might even walk by I mean, we tried to avoid that, of course. And the on-site crew was really great. So I was very, the timing was very specific. For A lot of times we shot really first thing early in the morning when they were not in this part of the building. And then when they broke, we went in and did our, a special interview. And then when they broke, they broke around three or four because they started really early. So I did most of my interviews towards the end of the day. Um, and then I just worked with the guys, Scotty, my best friend, who helped me control the set, so to speak. Some of the guys were not too happy with me some days, but, um, and the lighting, I just, uh, again, wherever we were, if there was natural light, we would use it. But um, I hired experienced camera people and there was a couple good people right in Chicago and, um, you know, we just did, you know, your basic uh, three-point lighting, really, right. um, because we had what was ever was going on in the background was great. So, so yeah. great. There's another one that directed, and then I'll hand it over back to you, Frank. As someone is dying to know why Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think somebody might be somebody you know, Gunny. Um, I try to answer on the chat. Why Brad Pitt? Because he's a big Frank Lloyd Wright fan really changed his life is what one of the, his longtime story. He's just a big architecture fan. He's best buddies with Frank Geary. He, he builds furniture himself. And um, the executive director at the time, 
um, had a personal connection. So we asked and he said yes. And, and he didn't want to come looking like, uh, he didn't want to pretend that he was Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, that right. was. Yeah. Okay. I had this, yeah. I had this kind of wild idea that I had said in one of the emails and I said, well, I mean, he's an actor. Maybe he could read it as right, you know, like maybe we could try that. And if it was cheesy, we just throw it out and we just. Or you could dress up in the Frank Lloyd Wright cape. Yeah, in the cape. No, but he said, oh no, we can't do that. And, uh, but he was very generous. And again, I feel like we were really lucky. Um, I love the quality of his voice. He had just made that movie Ad Astra. And when I saw that movie, I was just like, yes, it's gonna be great. Because there's this just substantive quality and this kind of raspiness. And, you know, it was a little right like, and I wanted to, I felt like, and I hoped that having Brad Pitt and his particular voice would lend some authenticity to it and infuse some of uh, a feeling of right, of right's presence by using the quotes. Thank you. Frank, to you, the baton. Okay. Yeah, Lauren, I'm just going to ask you one more question to keep it going with, with you because there's a, I think there's a really deep question um, about the layering. So, um, Question is, uh, one of the things I find most amazing about the film is the layering of it. Just like the building, it goes from the microscopic to the macro. I was stunned how your film also captured and revealed all the multiple layers of both right and the restoration work. Can you comment on how you approach the layering in addition to the linear narrative? In other words, both are going on at the same time. How did you sort that out? It's <laughs> very difficult, yeah. I saw it, I think it was Jeff who asked that question. I, I almost don't know where to start or to say it, but I'll try to say it quickly. Um, I, I did realize that the, on, the way that I had to have a structure and the way to do it was from the outside in. And, I, and that I had to, in a sense, separate the glass, the concrete, the wood, you know. But I didn't want it to be like that cheesy chapter thing. Okay, now we're gonna talk about this. Now we're gonna talk about this. I wanted it to be more fluid. And so how we did it editorially, which is really, really fun, but really, really challenging. Um, I found an editor who had made, first of all, had in a low budget situation, first of all, the one documentary person in most times is wearing way too many hats. And I had to find an editor who would work for me for a long time for not too much money. And I found this guy who was great. And he had made a film about a man who had lost the use of his legs, but still wanted to hike this big path in the mountains. And I thought, if this guy can make a film about a guy in a wheelchair, in the mountains, hiking on a path, appealing, he can do this. And, and he was into it too. He was into writing, he was into architecture. So that was just extra lucky. So uh, Tall Sklut is his name. And so, so it was him that helped me and that he really helped me find the pacing. And in fact, in order to entice him, I gave him the first section or a bound of footage I gave him was the story about the glass because I really had amazing, you know, really visual, tangible, you know, exciting stuff. My first string out of the concrete story was like 25 minutes and I didn't want to give him that. Um, so I gave him the story about the glass and he did a great job and I thought, okay, we're on our way. So we, you just have to keep throwing stuff up. You have to chunk, 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 chunk. And then you just keep whittling it down and then you go, that doesn't work. We have to try it this way and that doesn't work and we have to try it that way. And so you just keep going until it feels right and you like it. <laughs> okay, let's uh, return to the building. Um, so, so several questions revolve around, um, I think two bigger questions. Um, one set asks, um, how far did the historical documentation take you and how far uh, and how were how were the absences met with the physical investigation? In other words, how did you balance 
the information, the knowledge you learned through archival research with what the building itself had to, uh, could tell you in terms of its physical investigation. Where, where, what was the balance there? Where, where did it fall? And that's to both Gunny and to Dorothy. Dorothy, why don't you talk about the paint specs? But uh, I would be happy to. I did answer this um, a little bit in, uh, in one of the chats, so I apologize for that. But um, what was interesting is that Wright's original specifications did call for textured plaster and um, also a wash to be applied to the textured plaster. So even though it was a technical specification, it became clear that he had this vision for the, the walls and the ceilings to have a wash uh, and he uses the word translucent in the specification as well. So you get, you're starting to get a picture of his design intent through the, the written specification. He, the, the spec, uh, he called for that wash to be um, made with a glue size. So we just, uh, because we thought it'd be important to know for replication purposes, wanted to confirm if it was in fact made with that material, we did analysis and found that it was actually implemented with oil very diluted with solvent oil washes, which is a little unusual, um, but we've actually now since found them in other right buildings as well. But so again, you get the design intent and the spec, it was just implemented differently with a different material, um, but the overall effect was most likely the same. So we don't know when that change was made, but for the paint um, that, you know, there was a change made uh, conscious or either by right or by the contractor. So it just, it makes me realize, or makes me want to emphasize how important it is to do both the lab work and the archival research for all you right. conservators in the audience. Um, you really need to do both to get the full picture. Right. Frank, uh, can I jump in? There's a very wonderful question, I think, uh, that uh, uh, someone like Gunny can answer having worked on other Wright buildings and Mies buildings. And so it says, are there lessons learned from this restoration project? Uh, and Dorothy, you've also collaborated on those with me, uh, with Gunny. So are there any lessons from this restoration project would apply to other Frank Lloyd Wright restoration projects? And were there lessons from other efforts such as falling water that helped you in this one? I thought that's a interesting uh, multi- uh, Gunny? <laughs> find a, a, a very generous, uh, <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I, I, I can't emphasize how unbelievable uh, that is. Now, I have I have done a lot of projects where that wasn't the case, such as some of the Mies projects that are often financially challenged. Uh, the lesson learned is really just to do your homework, take the time, make sure that people understand that waiting to do it right. I mean, if you don't have a lot of money, it's better to take more time to figure things out so you're not sort of winging it that's number one um and and people get you know they don't want to wait they want once they finally get the money together to do something they want to see action um but every time we've taken the time to do to take the time to figure it out it goes much better when we did crown hall with crick and sexton who were the lead architects uh, there was a schedule. We were supposed to be doing it a year before we did, but we, we started to find out, oh, there's these questions and what, how do we do this and are we going to get the right glass and all these st things start coming up, mock-ups and, and all that. And we, we saw that we weren't going to make, by even close get, getting made to the schedule because of the seasonal aspect of, of only being able to work on Crown Hall the 15 weeks of the summer. So we said, okay, time out. Let's take extra time. Let's figure it out. You know, take a deep breath. And we did, and it was much better. You know, trying to force things to happen sooner than they need to happen is a, is a, is a very good lesson learned. I mean, I, I, we always try to make sure we meet our clients' expectations with what we believe is going to be needed. Okay. Now, there's one for you, Gunny. Uh, maybe a friend, uh, he uh, addresses you by name, with your many restoration plans and preservation work, is there a single building that you would wish to have the chance to restore or create a restoration preservation plan for? Whether I've add, I'm adding in the, in the Americas or beyond, you don't have to, uh, you, uh, it could be the Taj Mahal for all. Uh, uh, so. I'd work on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The next one is always, no. 
Uh, yeah, there are so many. Um, Taliesin. I mean, we're working at Taliesin West right now. We, we did a master plan, preservation master plan for them four or five years ago now. And we continue to do small projects for them. Uh, and that, I guess we could be working out there two lifetimes probably because they never had mm. the resources to do it all at once. And, and uh, 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 both Dorothy and Frank have had involvement out there as well. Frank has graduate students that are um, doing studies and one of them is a post grad or whatever. I, I, when did he post? He's a postdoc or he's getting his PhD. Um, Evan, and he's working with us on the current project where we're investigating uh, what can we do to replicate Wright's fabric roof system in a way that doesn't leak like hell that they always mm -hmm. did, uh, and that we can try to mitigate the harsh environment that was never meant to be lived in in the summertime uh, because they use that thing 365. So how, how can we do that? So that's a current project that's quite interesting and, and fun. Um, I don't know. It's There's so many wonderful opportunities. I just feel really, really, really lucky that I've gotten to do what I've been able to do. And I look forward to the next ones. We're working on two really cool ones right now, and Dorothy's involved with that as well. So, uh, yeah, the next one. <laughs> Penny. Um, some of the questions have, um, have asked about the past restoration, um, and, um, you know, rather than, take, rather than take a deep dive into that, um, and, and I think it certainly is represented, uh, in, in the film, um, you, you, I'm sure you know that you, you, you know you're, you aren't the first and you're not gonna be the last to deal with this building um, as, a, as a major work in terms of its restoration. So um, with hindsight being 2020, what, um, what have you thought about? What have you done to take this building, to allow this building to go into the future with fewer problems? Um, have you done a maintenance plan um, how have you passed this on so that the next time around it might be easier um, and, and you can take that any way you want? Well, maintenance plan is always a good idea, but it's one of those things that clients are fed up and don't have any money at the end of the job to actually do one sometimes. And uh, that was also a little bit true on Unity. We are actually going to do one, I think, uh, this summer. They're in the midst of trying to raise some money to do it. Um, we wasn't very long after we were done. This is, you know, one of those dark side stories where, where things in the unity house were beginning to get abused because, you know, people just aren't careful or whatever. And there's giant scrapes and scratches in the beautiful restored <laughs> plaster and paint services. So, uh, we did work with that, with the congregation who has the you know, responsibility of keeping upkeep. And um, one of the guys that was the one of the key painters on the job, Frank, is um, uh, engaged with them to do. I don't know. I don't know what the how often he comes out, but he knows exactly what to do to come out and make the repairs. Now the problem is, is that the repair, the, the the method to repair those scratches and stuff like that, it's not exactly the same as the original um, beautiful overall surface. So. Hopefully they can keep those damages to a minimum so it doesn't all become re repainted damaged areas, uh, which is quite frankly, some, some of the way that they dealt with it in the past. So uh, they just have to be really careful. This is, you know, the investment that was made there needs to, to be respected and they need to make sure that people take care of it. On the other hand, it's a living usable building and the, the very lively and active congregation after COVID's okay. over anyway and it's going to get used. So uh, it's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered fully the question, but anyway, that's the one that comes to mind. Right. So can I ask you a question, uh, uh, and uh, Gani? Um, so, you know, so many of these decisions uh, that were made throughout the process were made, you know, in your office, on site, and dialogue with Dorothy. So how how do you kind of 
record uh, this kind of process? Um, I mean, Lauren has filmed interviews, right? But is there a systematic way of passing on this incredibly uh, nuanced um, project? You know, so I'm, I'm asking you, are you going to write a book about this uh, Unity Temple? Uh, and uh, you know, anyone who might want to fund that, as you know, <laughs> Mr. Book Writer. Uh, you know, films are very expensive, but books are also expensive. And it's a matter of finding someone willing to afford to, to, to allow us to take the time to do all that. We certainly have the documentation. We have files and files I've taken personally, took thousands of photographs. I know uh, my friend Steve Kelly, who was a member of the congregation and was there in a, in a, a, a really good uh, preservation architect and engineer on his own right. He documented the thing with thousands of pictures. The guy that was the president of the of the congregation took thousands of photographs. All that stuff is available, whether or not I don't believe it's all been jointly archived and all that. It should be, but right. again, it takes time. Someone's got to, you know, takes hours and hours for people to do that. It looks like you have to write a grant to, to Alpha Wood for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Okay, Frank, to you. Now, uh, just to my mindful, we're looking at another 10 minutes or so. Uh, so um, we should be careful to I, uh, cover as many more questions as possible. I think we're doing a good job uh, so far, but um, have anyone slipped, uh, Frank? Um, there was one question which um, resonated with, with me uh, when I saw the film which was the exterior lighting. This, this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue with buildings, um, particularly in the 20th century when lighting became a component of building presentation. But I noticed in one of the night shots, there was up lighting uh, on the building, very dramatic. Um, but I, I, I had my suspicions it wasn't um, originally uh, considered, uh, or if it was when it, when it arrived or was this something that was done to promote the the building after post restoration what what's the story on that yeah well the original lighting wasn't any i mean there were the two the elephant ear fixtures that there's some right. discussion of in the film that was it uh <laughs> there was a desire on the part of the client that there be better lighting to highlight oh. and celebrate the building and um, that's true inside and out. I mean, there's a lot of supplemental. And inside, it was a bigger deal because uh, we had to come up with a way to um, to allow the people in the balconies to be able to read their hymnals in, in the dark. And so there's this directional LED lighting that's up above the lay lights that projects down. And so you can see it. And we added you know, some other uh, technology for projection and stuff like that as well but anyway the the way that we approached it uh, uh, charter sills was our um, lighting consultant and um, our desire always was that we had to have the base lighting would be to replicate as close as possible the original incandescent lighting that was there and originally there was just a single light bulb that hung over each one of those lay lights okay um, which is inadequate for what we expect to get today so that was a whole very complicated and expensive uh, exercise. And there are different scenes that can be, um, that we developed so that, you know, you can have more light pumped up lighting when they have the need for it, or you can go, you know, the default is supposed to be the historic lighting, but of course, getting them to let that be the case is not always the case. And on the outside, I'll just say that we did it, of course, um, at the request of, of, the, of the client to have this uh, highlights and be able to, to beautify the building, but you can just turn them off if you wanna see how it was. And uh, I, I think that's very acceptable. You know, the fact that it's on all the time, you can take that up with them. Uh, but, and again, this is not unusual. Everybody, because we have such ability now uh, with the LED technology to create whatever coloring you want. I mean, if they wanted, they could do a whole disco dance out there. You know, we, we made sure that they weren't going to do that. You know, you make it green on St. Patty's Day and you do whatever. 
uh, like they do on some of the tall buildings in the city. And I'm sure they do that in New York as well. Uh, you just have to be careful with it. And it's, it's a legitimate question, but I think that it was appropriate for, for what the uh, desire was from the client side. And, and lastly, on my end, um, were there any decisions that, uh, that, that your team came to that were considered controversial by anyone doing oversight, whether it was the congregation themselves or the historical commission? I mean, wh where, where were the disagreements, if there were any, and how did you resolve them? I don't think there were any disagreements. I mean, personally, for, I think for the team, I think the biggest, it wasn't a controversy, but the, I guess the, the compromise decision, because that's what it was, was the decision to actually overcoat all the plaster with new plaster. I mean, this, that is not uh, what we would typically want to do with an authentic restoration. You'd want to try to retain as much original fabric and to conserve it, right? But that wasn't an option here. We tried really hard to be able to do it. In fact, what was interesting was that we were not able to do that at Unity. So basically what that means is that, first of all, everything that had a horizontal, all the ceiling plaster had to go because of the, the structural problems with the slab. So everything had to be sounded. That meant all that had to come off, whether it was sound or not. And a lot of it wasn't. Um, we lost a lot of the original plaster in Unity House because it was delaminating from the wall. And we, we couldn't, you know, we weren't, we did a lot, but you're not about to sit there and inject you know, adhesive in behind to try to get it to buy. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, so anyway, that decision to replicate the finish authentically, that was a compromise, but I think it was the right one, and we wouldn't have gotten what we got. At Roby House, which interestingly was very parallel to this, following a little bit after, there we were able to restore, not everywhere, but most places, that's the original plaster, and uh, new, new, new finish applied on top of it. We, we, because they had stripped off the old paint and that's a long story, that's a whole nother hour in its own. Um, but there we were much more successful. Now the current project I'm doing with Dorothy is it another step forward that I've never done before where we are scraping off 1970s gray paint off of the original paint. And we can do it in a way where we are able to reconstitute restore or conserve the original paint surfaces almost entirely in a huge, uh, beautiful 1890s space that's going to blow people's minds. And uh, the original uh, metal leaf is the original metal leaf that's still there and in most places intact. It's about 90%, 80-90% intact, so we will have to do some uh, replication, but most of it's going to be the original finishes. And I i don't think Dorothy's ever been able to do that either. Maybe you have on a smaller scale, but not at this scale. Um, yeah. Mind-blowing. It's fabulous. It's going to be, that, that's the one that we're doing now that's going to be great. We're de-painting. We're, we're taking, we're moving paint. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're scraping it up. You know, they're scraping. I, we, yeah. we're, they're, we're the, I'll just, I was just going to add, I, the one thing I'll add to what you just said about the idea of it not being ideal from a preservation perspective to put new plaster on everything, and that really was our, our only option, but um, in a way, it, it is a good preservation technique because we've preserved the original plaster and original finishes um, behind it. So. You know, it's for, on one hand, one preservation hand, it wasn't ideal, but on the other hand, it is a good preservation measure because we did preserve everything behind it on the walls. Mm. Great. Frank, uh, are, are we going to do the last question? Uh, uh, just make it a, make it a, a, a whopper of a question. Uh, <laughs> Open-ended or? A, uh... Well, I think we should give, uh, we're, we're at time, so. Um, I, I'm, you know, thank you everyone for your questions. I hope we've done them justice. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've tried to get as many of them or coalesce them together um, where they had similar uh, uh, tracks. Um, but I'd like to give our, our uh, panel a last word actually. Um, so uh, anything you want to leave us and the audience with uh, in terms of this project? <clears throat> I already
sorry, I'll go first because I've already said too much. So we'll let the other two have the last word. But uh, go go see the building. It's in. Yeah. You got to you got to go experience it in person. Yeah. And and thank you uh, to Lauren and her dedication, but also just to everybody that worked on that job. And and again, I I said this before, but it can't be overstated. It takes a village. I mean, it was so many people all bringing their A game. That is what made that thing possible. So really grateful for that. I'll say quick, um, Gunny, when we thought we were going to have a big premiere with the crew and everybody, the whole lot of people, I cried when I knew we weren't going to be able to do it. I was a little teary because I thought, oh my God, because I really felt so, I wanted to be in the room with everyone who worked on it, you know? So anyway, this was great for me and I really appreciate everyone's interest. It is actually, I did extend it a couple of days. If, people who were here didn't see it, you can go to the unitytemplefilm.com and you can still see it on Vimeo through the weekend. So if you missed it. Maybe you could put that in the chat. Uh, there were some questions about access. So uh, we appreciate that. Thank you, Lauren. Dorothy? Uh, I just, you know, as we're sitting here talking about it and I had the same reaction when I watched Lauren's film, I just feel very fortunate. And I'm very grateful to be here tonight and just to have had the opportunity to work on that building and other right buildings. I never imagined 20 years ago, Frank, when I was looking through my first microscope with you um, that I would have the opportunity to work on such buildings. So I, I just mainly feel grateful. So thank you, Gunny, for involving me. By the way, we didn't say this to the students in the room, but I was a, I was a student of Frank's too. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't want to admit that, but... Uh, uh, oh, I do. absolutely why wouldn't I no because it you're makes, famous it, it makes, you're famous it, you, you must have just been a, you were just a kid you were just a kid because you're not you're not For that sure. much older than me and anyway <laughs> I I uh Frank was a huge influence on me and uh he was my thesis advisor even though I made him let me change my thesis <laughs> and uh I've, I've always taken you know I still I I still have our students read your stuff so i uh, thank you for all you did to train me and i i wouldn't be here without all the other wonderful influence that i got well that's you. how it's supposed to work yeah <laughs> so. well and thank you uh thank you uh gunny lauren and dorothy for making this accessible the story through the videography the documentary and and i'm happy that we're uh chicago is uh sort of providing sort of exemplar uh, sort of uh, examples of uh, sort of how to do restoration, taking your time, even though it costs money. So uh, thank you all. And thank you, Frank, for uh, your leadership in this event. No, I was really happy to do it. I hope we can do more. Lauren, keep making more films. <laughs> and we'll love do this to. again. Michelangelo, I think we should take this show on the road. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're gonna and Lauren, you know, don't uh, don't uh, uh, you know? There's still post vaccination. There's still time to come to Chicago. Remember, and, uh, we will uh, uh, hang out together uh, in uh, Crown Hall and in Unity Temple. So then uh, oh. uh, uh, Gunny will uh, provide the drinks. Awesome. Awesome. I'm okay, there. everyone, with that, let's wrap it up. Uh, thank you all uh, to the audience. Uh, we couldn't see you, but we felt you. Thank you for, uh, for, for joining us tonight. It really was a terrific turnout. And um, we'll do this again. And panelists, thank you again for the work you did and for tonight. All right. So be well, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.